The yeah, recording great. started. Great, excellent. The last session of Yay. the Fizz and Sparkle retreat with Ajahn Bram. So normally we're not live yeah. streaming at this time, but we thought we would because yeah, this is the last not, yeah. helpful words on how to apply Dhamma in everyday life. Yeah. And then we'll do some meta meditation and have a little bit of discussion to end. So, Yay. are you ready, Ajahn, now that you're ah. back from the dead? <laughs> Yeah, those were actually quite interesting. I, we had a power cut over here, and just for five or ten minutes, not quite sure what. But anyway, we're all ready to go. But I did have my little tablet, and that gave this very spooky vision of me, just because no light in the room, and there was just some light off the, the, um, the battery light, and it made me look really spooky. And there would be time to actually, if I was still spooky lighting, I would have given some, some lovely ghost stories. Because <laughs> I, can't, I can't almost ignore those. There's some beautiful stories. Like this one story, it's in my mind, I'm going to tell it now, how we can use the Dhamma in our daily lives. And it was just this woman who, she was a Sri Lankan, and she uh, managed to... Uh, unfortunately, gets a very bad cancer. Oh, I forget exactly what it was. But then uh, they took her, her relations took her from uh, Sri Lanka over to Singapore. They thought to get better treatment over there, but nothing really helped. And she was dying. And she only had about three or four days to live. And as she was dying, that her sister called me, please, 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 can I just get you to give my sister some advice over the next few evenings? And so I talked to her. She couldn't talk back because she was paralyzed from the neck down and she couldn't even say very much, just almost like grunting. Anyway, I talked to her for three nights. On the fourth night, she never uh, called up. I realized that she must have died. And the fifth night was a wonderful part of this because her sister called and said, Ajahn Brahma, I would not lie to you. There's no reason for me to lie to you. But I got an email uh, sort of uh, this morning. And the email was from my sister. And she was dead at the time the email was sent. And the email said, <laughs> please thank Ajahn Brahm and thank you, sister, you know, for helping me at this time. Or something like that. And she was dead. When the email was sent, it couldn't have been sent beforehand because she was paralyzed for such a long time. So I always remember that story, that if you're a good practitioner of Dhamma, then even when you're dead, you can send emails. <laughs> and you know, there's the joke behind that. It, it was a true story, but I always make some, uh, something useful out of it. That's because I wasn't all that sort of uh, understanding of how email works, but I understand that's what Gmail means. Ghost mail. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to being reasonably serious. One of the problems with uh, living in our life is how to continue the process of meditation, uh, even when you're working, uh, when you're tired, when it's late, whatever's happening. And sometimes it's if you feel that meditation is important and valuable, you feel this practice is useful, then you will find that time. One of the problems is, though, that when people, they get some joy and happiness out of the meditation, that it can e very easily fall away. And one reason why it does fall away is because you don't associate with good people. You associate with people, you know, in, in town, in your company, in sort of uh, people selling you stuff. And that's one of the reasons why we do have spiritual communities. And this is the story behind this was of this royal elephant. And this is in one of the Jataka tales, but it's a very beautiful story. This royal elephant in many, many years ago in India was a prize, it was like a, uh, the vehicle which the kings would use because in the jungle, it's a waste of time having a car or something. You need an elephant which was tall enough to go through the bush safe enough to go through the jungles and strong enough to go up the hills and the mountains and across the rivers. 
So some of these elephants were so prized in some uh, realms in the time of uh, the Buddha. And this particular elephant was one of the very, very best, always well behaved and always very obedient. And the king loved him, was well looked after. But one day, that elephant, he had water in his mouth, in his trunk, and he squirted it at the king. Never done that before. And when he pooed, he pooed just when the, the trainer was right behind him. In other words, he started to become um, a little bit sort of uh, badly behaved. He was losing his virtue. And so the king knew that this was a very good elephant. It must be some disease or something. So he got all the best doctors and vets to find out what was wrong with this elephant. They couldn't find anything wrong with him at all. He was in really good health. And so uh, according to these stories, you read these in the Jatakas, it's a good story. Whether you believe it or not, it's not as important as the fact that it makes so much sense. So what happened was the uh, one of the ministers in that government sort of uh, said, I I'll try and find out, get some more information. Instead of making conclusions, I will stay by the elephant you know, for 24 hours and just to see what happens. And so having no, uh, no ideas what he would discover, this minister went to the elephant enclosure and sat there in the evening and at night time still meditated quietly. And then it was in the early morning, about two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, that the minister heard a sound behind the elephant enclosure. And that sound, he investigated it very carefully. He found there was some, some bandits and robbers who had used the space behind the elephant enclosure as a meeting place in the evening. So they could decide who they were going to rob, who they were going to beat up, even who they were going to kill. And because they were you know, badly behaved people, the, the elephant was picking up on their vibes. Even though the association wasn't verbal, it was just being around sort of people who said bad things or did bad things. The elephant was picking up on that. So after a while, the, <coughs> uh, the minister left, told the king. The next night, the king had the soldiers wait for those thieves and arrested them all. And the minister arranged for good monks and good nuns to go behind the elephant stall to meditate and to talk and discuss the Dhamma and to chant. And after two or three days, the elephant returned to his virtuous behavior again, very reliable and lovable, just like he was before. And the meaning of that story is that the people we associate with can sometimes condition us and make us into good people or bad people. So it's one of the reasons why we have to be careful who we associate with and why it is the case that say in a Bodhinyana monastery, Sometimes men come here for a few days and their wives say afterwards, oh, they're such good men after this, such good husbands. Thank you for, for cooling them down. Or if they go to a nun's monastery, Bhikkhuni's monastery, after a few days, your wives will become so peaceful and so calm and non-argumentative and always seeing the very best in you uh, because that's what the Bhikkhunis are like associating with virtuous people, like their virtue rubs off. Associating with good people, that's one of the causes for you to become good. And so little by little, that association with good spiritual people encourages you to meditate, encourages you to keep precepts, encourages you to be kind. And it's something which works on such a deep level that sometimes you don't even notice it's actually happening. I don't know if I should say this, but there was a, a few monks who became monks with me. They disrobed eventually. And some of those monks who disrobed, and they get married. And they always ask me to do their marriage ceremony for them. I do do some chanting. And some of those, the wives afterwards, they said, oh, thank you so much. The wives, okay. Thank you so much for training my husband three or four years in a monastery, they get well-trained, they know how to wash up, 
they know how to be obedient, they know how to be kind, they know how to be virtuous, they're very good husbands once they've been trained in the monastery. And it's the same if we only had a few more nuns and you actually you know, come and stay a little while in a bhikkhuni monastery, then, oh, you'll be such a wonderful woman. And many men, if they really wanted to, would like to uh, be your friends. Little by little, you see the association with the wise and the calm and the kind and the virtuous, it actually makes you more virtuous. So little by little, we realize the importance of having good people around in our community, virtuous people. And sometimes you see whether it's politicians, police, it's uh, people like uh, priests and uh, other people in authority. How many of those do you really trust these days? How many are really virtuous? But then when it comes to monastics, you know, there's some I disagree with, uh, you know, when they don't allow bhikkhunis to become bhikkhunis. But at least they they have a higher level of virtue than the ordinary people. So just associating with them, being with them, it does create a very good impression on you and encourages others to meditate. If you're in a room meditating by yourself, if you're skilled at meditation, it's not that hard to do. But if you're by yourself, so if you're with other people, that it's not like peer pressure. It's like you're being dragged along in a stream of peace and joy and stillness. I noticed this even just in Bodhinyana Monastery, where I spent the last 38 years. That if I have a good meditation one evening, it's amazing that many other monks have a good meditation the same evening. It's as if the one person does something good. And then the energy just, just brings other people along. That's one of the reasons why and it is really helpful to be able to meditate with, with wise, peaceful people, with kind people, and like Ayachanda. People who have let go of so much and live a very simple life. And so that you can feel a little bit the energy, what it must be like to be still and be peaceful and be free. It's one of the reasons why that the Buddha made a Sangha of monks and nuns, so that people could see you know, where this leads to. You know, when I decided to become a monastic, I went to many, many uh, temples in London to try and find out what type of tradition I wanted to join. And it wasn't the, the philosophy behind that tradition, or just how they explained Buddhism, which was important to me. It was how they lived, those teachings, which were important. I wanted to see monks and nuns who were peaceful, who were kind. And not so much what they knew, but how they practiced. And that's one of the reasons why a spiritual community is really, really important to how you put these teachings of Buddhism into practice in your, in your daily life. And when you do that, you have a refuge, a refuge you can go to. And it's you know, not just a refuge of ideas, it's a refuge of, of practices. Look, sometimes I feel I might get into trouble by saying such things, but I don't really believe that's so. Because every time I taught these things so many times, and that people actually find them very helpful, very useful. You know, in England, in Europe, it's a, a multi-religious society. You meet people of so many different faiths. And I, you know, I've made an effort of not isolating myself just in the Buddhist community, but making many, many friends in the different uh, religious communities here in Perth, in Australia. And I remember just uh, going, being invited to what's called Christchurch Grammar School, it's one of the top grammar schools here in Perth, a private school, that's why they call it a grammar school. But anyway, it's next to the next to the, the River Swan, beautiful views, and very, very expensive to send your kid there. 
But anyway, the one morning that uh, they invited me to go and give a talk at their morning assembly. And I knew the chaplain more than anybody else, Frank Sheehan. We used to work at the Cancer Support Association, not far away from there. And anyway, uh, I got there early and we were supposed to wait outside the chapel um, before the chaplain, the headmaster and myself would go in. It was the headmaster, the principal, who told me, so this is a Christian school. And he took that part of the school very seriously. And he said that when we go inside the assembly hall, we have a little shrine to Jesus there. He said, when we go in, I will bow. So the chaplain and the principal will bow to the little statue of Jesus. But because I'm a Buddhist, please, you don't have to bow. I remember that occasion because I use it as an opportunity. And I said to the principal, um, excuse me, but I demand my right to bow to your statue of Jesus. And he was quite surprised what I said. And I had the time to explain that when I bow to a statue of the Buddha, I never bow to a lump of metal or to a lump of statue made out of stone or of wood or whatever. What I bow to is what that means to me, what it represents. When I see a statue of the Buddha, it means to me the beauty of virtue, of goodness. If you have precepts, you keep them. The kind precepts, the generous precepts, the honest precepts, you don't lie. And I've seen the benefit of that in my life and other people's lives so much that I can bow to that very easily. When I bow to it, it's like I'm feeling these things are so important. They're above me. I put my head down in worship, finding worth in these qualities. And my next bow is to peace. And my third bow is to kindness. There's peace in the community where I live, peace in, my, in the world, peace in my own heart, peace in my meditation. And the last one is kindness, compassion which I always inspires me. You know, when we had a little blackout there, and the two monks you might have seen in the beginning, I think the people organizing this saw, I never asked them to come out to my hut to help out. There's no way I could. They just came because they knew that I might be in trouble not being able to connect you know, and do my service for you. And they came up and sorted it all out for me. Not being asked, living with a community like of kind people, People are looking after you, finding out what you need before you even ask them. It's a beautiful thing to have. And so that kindness is what I bow to. And when I said that to the principal, now he said he understood. And the three of us went into the hall, the assembly hall, with three of us bowed together to the statue of Jesus, because I could see something in there I respect. I don't respect everything, otherwise I'd be a Christian. I'm not a Christian, I'm a Buddhist. And now I find that Buddhas are much more meaningful for me. But still I could find something in there to respect and bow to. And that's what I did. And then I never realized what that, that attitude meant to the principal, because he was quite a well-known gentleman, one of the leading Christians in Australia. And he arranged a trip, a bus trip for many of his students to actually to come to Bodhinyana Monastery and to uh, appreciate what Buddhism was. He arrived early in his own car, and I met him in the car park, and the two of us together, we went into Bodhinyana's meditation hall. There was a big statue of the Buddha. And the two of us together, side by side, we bowed three times to the Buddha statue. I paused there. All we bowed to was virtue, peace and compassion. It's a wonderful way of using this Buddhism in our daily life to actually, to actually make a more harmonious and peaceful world. And people could understand that. And to this day, you know, when I see people who aren't really Buddhists, and one of the things which they dislike is you know, all this bowing stuff, and they think it's cultural accretion to the teachings of the Buddha. Once you understand what it means and how it can be used, Wow, they really get it. 
and get all these Westerners who vowed they never bow to anything, bowing to the statue of the representing virtue, peace, and compassion. So little things like that create peace and harmony in our world, and that creates the opportunities to meditate and have some stillness. That's one of the reasons why over many, many years of people experiencing the benefits of things like meditation, you have meditation rooms in Google, the headquarters in San Francisco, and also in Facebook, I've sat in both of those, and apparently in uh, Michael Dell's, um, what's it called, Dell Computing, they have a meditation room in there. And people can go any time they want to have a quiet time for themselves. And the reason they do this is because just like that elephant, you can get stressed out in work. Just for a time, a peaceful time with other peaceful people, a time to relax and rest is a great, what the other companies say, is a great investment for the happiness, well-being of their workforce and also for their greater commitment to the company. If you look after others, they look after you. And it's one of the reasons why that many smart companies, I know I have a med I have many meditation rooms in my company, <laughs> in the Buddhist society, Western Australia, making sure that people have the opportunity any time to go into those meditation rooms and relax to the max. Because mm -hmm. sometimes life is very stressful. And the ability to find a little place where you can just sit down and be peaceful. It's wonderful. It means afterwards you become far more productive in your life. Even uh, these days, wherever you, you live or practice, the very, very least, you know, you have your toilets. As I keep on saying, the American term for the toilet is a restroom. A restroom, why does it say restroom? I think it's a beautiful thing to turn it more into a restroom than a water closet. Especially Japanese toilets, they don't have any water in them. Well, they do in the bottom, but they, they, they squirt water up into your right places and they dry them up all by themselves. So it's more like a, a place where you can clean yourself comfortably and, and, and peacefully, where you can relax and rest. And I've often told people, if you can't find any other place to meditate, to find some stillness, go into the toilet, sit on the chair in the toilet and meditate for 15 minutes. Just 15 minutes, that's all. When your boss says, where have you been? You said, I was in the toilet because I was constipated. But don't tell him you meant mentally constipated. In other words, you went there to relax and let go. And you do find it's been proven so many times, especially, you know, in Harvard Business School took this on. They call those 15 minute breaks or half an hour breaks, however much you can get away with, as an investment in time. You become much more productive, much more innovative, more peaceful afterwards. Which is why sensible companies, when they're looking at their bottom line, they put all those bottoms on the floor and as after they meditate. To me, I call that the bottom line <laughs> of good management. To allow people to be peaceful. And when you understand, you can find it out for yourself. Even I, sometimes you have to write emails. When you write emails, sometimes you can't find the right words. You give talks and you can't find the right words. But if you sit down and meditate and be quiet, then the words come very easily. When you have a bit of meditation, then the email, you can write an email so fast, so quickly, you've got all the right terms. If you haven't, you're looking at that computer and nothing is really coming out. What is coming out is forced and it doesn't look good. And even the, to make an example of that, even that book which I wrote, Opening the Door of Your Heart, I wrote that out, half of it, by hand. And I still got the original copy just written out by hand. One hour every day 
for 15 days or 14 days, to be honest, one hour for 14 days. And I've got the manuscript. And actually, believe it or not, it's in the museum in Western Australia right now. To see just how, there's hardly any mistakes in it. There's no editing needed. Because it was done you know, in a time when you're doing some meditation. It's so easy to do. Just things just flowed. You never interrupted them. All done by hand. It is really a manuscript, nothing printed. I didn't have a computer at that time. And I say, how on earth can you do that? The only way you can do that is actually to meditate, first of all. It's so peaceful, so still. Everything comes out beautifully. So little by little, you realize the benefits of meditation. When you do know the benefits, then it's easy to find the time. And when you find the time, it's easy to find the space. And the benefits of that, if you haven't got a big house, if you've only got a small house, then the corner of your room is fine. Or well, like this one couple years ago, they said that, I think this was before Harry Potter lived under the stairs. They had a space under their stairs in their house in Australia. And they just cleaned all that out. And that's their meditation room. When they had two kids, a boy and a girl, they told me that the boy and the girl were not allowed in the meditation room. What happened one day was uh, the boy and the girl were outside. They're only about four and six, about that age. And then the girl, the four-year-old, was hit by her big brother. And she burst out crying. It was the first time, I think, that uh, her elder brother hit her. And she burst out crying. Well, the parents said that what she did next was really stunned them. The girl just ran to the space under the stairs, stopped crying, and sat in the meditation uh, place. It's the first time she'd ever been in there. She needed to go into the place of peace. Having little places like that in your house are great. Even your children realize this is a place of safety and security where you can go. So if you find meditation really important for yourself and others, then you find those places in your house, in your apartment, in your wherever you happen to be living. You can find those places when you have the place there. Don't ever do anything else in there except the meditation. Yeah, you can do some uh, reading of books or listening to talks, but please make it like a pure spiritual place for yourself. You have TV rooms, you have video rooms, you have toilet rooms, you have bathrooms, bedrooms, goodness knows what else. But why don't we have a, an important place, a spiritual room, where we can just sit down We make the place for that. And the benefits you will find from it are enormous, which means that you have a place to find peace and quiet. And you can actually get that peace and quiet because it's right there for you. A little by little, that's actually how we can encourage the practice in our daily lives. We find it works. I don't know how many times doctors have told me just how well these things work. And uh, people with diseases, things like, uh, what did I say the other day? Scrub typhus. Uh, food poisoning, dysentery in Thailand, all this other stuff which you know you've had in your life, and uh, still it amazes me just how meditation can actually give you a much greater sense of health. Even over in California, if you can get somebody to sign a form saying that you're a meditator regularly, you get a reduction in your in your health insurance premium. People know that it's good for your well-being and health. And also that you have that spiritual community, you know the people, you sometimes meditate with them, you hear the talks. A good person, otherwise you'd be, you were started off as a good elephant, but then you become a bad elephant afterwards. <laughs> Don't blame yourself, it's just a lack of that spiritual community the lack of good people around you. And sometimes you don't have to explain things to people, just being with people calms you down and inspires you. The, years ago, this, this member of our Buddhist society, he went to Thailand. I'm just going over a little bit, Venerable Chanda, because I started late. 
he went to, to Thailand and he, he saw this woman crying in the grounds of a monastery, the Thai woman. And she cried her eyes out. And he thought, should I help her? Should I not help her? And he didn't know the cultural significance of being in the temple, how to go and help somebody. So he went inside the temple, temple and meditated for 15 or 20 minutes or something, gave a donation afterwards. And as he came out, he saw the same woman and she wasn't crying anymore. She was actually just sitting there still. And so he thought, oh, what a hell about cultural sensitivities. He wanted to go and see if he could be of assistance. So he went up to her and said, you know, I saw you crying here. Is there anything I can do to help? She said, no, 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 I'm okay. So said, well, why were you crying? And she said, I lost my car keys. <laughs> and I was crying. I went into the temple to be allowed to cry by myself. He said, now I feel fine now. I can go and get a taxi home or something. It's not really a terrible tragedy. But even though there's places of peace where you can just go, just be, and no one will really disturb you. That's actually sometimes all we really need, because the peace of the place, the kindness of the place, the association with other good, kind people around her, that's what got rid of her crying. It's just sometimes we overreact. Sometimes we just need peaceful people around to get some of their energy, and after a while, we're at peace too. So spiritual community and also places where you can meditate and just associating with kind people. That is how to take your meditation out there into the world. If you do have a group of people in your company or office, form a meditation group. Many people do that. And their company says, oh yeah, we'll do that. Or you can just... Um, if you're in lockdown or have to work from home, just tell people, okay, for a certain amount of time every day, we'll just log in together on Zoom and we'll do a little 10 or 15 minute meditation at lunchtime. Little things like that. Make it happen. Then you find the benefits of meditation, the progress of your, of your spiritual development goes on and on and on and on and on, deeper and deeper more and more benefit for yourself and all your family and friends. Okay, so that's a bomb going on and on and on, old monk. So anyway, the next thing we're supposed to do is have a tiny break and then we'll do the laughing kindness meditation. Is that okay? And then after that's finished, we'll do a two minute break because you know, we're 10 minutes shorter of time because of the blackout over here. So two or three minutes if you want to uh, alleviate yourself, let go, relieve yourself of pressure. If you've got resilience, like I was taught resilience by Ajahn Charles, sometimes you go on for hours and you couldn't go out until you finished. But now my bladder is very strong. <laughs> it's true, sometimes you can endure for such a long time, it's amazing. Uh -oh. Okay, a funny story. I remember one of the first times which I uh, visited my family in the UK after going to Australia. It's a long flight. I think I did go via, I think via Singapore. And on the flight from Singapore to UK, this was an economy class in the cheap airline. They put me in a window seat. There was a free space next to me, but the aisle seat was a woman and you no, know, I was thin in those days. She would actually look like I do today. She was, she had gravitas. She looked like a donut, but without a hole. It wasn't a hole, she was just a lay person. But then because of my rules as a monk, you can't actually climb over the woman to go to the toilet. So I remember just sitting there for a long time. And then when she got up to go to the toilet, I also rushed up and made sure I got to another toilet quickly, did my business quickly to get up before she came back. Otherwise, I say, excuse me, and she would just move her legs and have to climb over her, which was against my rules. So you had to be very mindful and very aware, but I was also very grateful to the training got from Ajahn Chah to be able to restrain 
and just to wait and be patient. And I've still got that ability today. No health problems. I'm able to sit there and talk and then go to the toilet later. Easy. Thank you, Ajahn Chah, for your training. Okay, I don't know what doctors feel about that. You say, oh, you're going to damage this and damage that. I think fear damages more parts of your body than anything else. So anyway, now is the time for the loving kindness meditation. So here we go. So it's going to be going on. So we said about 10 past. So let's get it going. 10 past nine. Quarter past nine. Quarter past nine. Okay. Okay, so if you can close your eyes. And with my loving kindness meditation, the way I developed it, I did realize that when you light a fire, you have to start with something which is easy to light, like a piece of paper. And then after you have the piece of paper, then you can put on some kindling, some thin sticks, from the thin sticks, the bigger sticks, and the bigger sticks, the even larger logs, and the larger logs, then you can put on even the wet logs, ones which are really damp. And the fire is so hot by that time, it can evaporate all the moisture, and even the difficult logs to burn can take the fire. And that's just like the beings we spread loving kindness towards. At first, we put something simple to develop the the emotion, the feeling, the thing which we know as loving kindness. And once that's developed, then we can put on more difficult things and then more difficult things and then the really difficult things in the end. And sometimes it's amazing that people sometimes think, I can't love that person. Oh, it has caused me so much misery and trouble. And you find you can. You start with easy things and you work your way up. So anyway, so sitting down, if you can't be kind enough to your body to sit in a comfortable position, then where are you starting loving kindness from? This is not, a, not a, an intellectual exercise, this is a practice. Be kind to your body. So how does it feel right now? If you need to move the body, to adjust it, to scratch it, adjust the clothing, fidget. Please do so. The fidget, the scratch is loving kindness. You're being gentle and compassionate to your own body. So I'm gonna be fidgeting a little bit to get my body as comfortable as it can do just out of loving kindness to my own 70 year old body. making sure my legs are comfortable, my butt is comfortable, my back is comfortable. Well, it's, actually it's not, so I can move it. I'm making sure that my arms are comfortable. Just simple kindness. If you've had a, a, a child you looked after, you tuck it into bed at night, maybe read it a story, stroke its hair, wish it good night, it feels safe, it feels comfortable, it feels loved. Very easy to make it relax and fall asleep. If you Look at that little kid in bed and say, fall asleep or else. Of course, the kid's never going to fall asleep. Might pretend to never fall asleep when there's no safety, love or fear. 
So when there's fear. So give safety and love to your body. You care for it. And then you take your attention away from your body and do a it's a visualization exercise. Imagination if you like. But a visualization, instead of visualizing you're like a Buddha under the Bodhi tree like we did a couple of days ago. Now you visualize that you're walking down a part of the the town in which you live, or you're visiting somebody in another place and you're, you're walking outside. And you hear the sound of some animal in distress. And I usually imagine a little kitten. I don't know, I like kittens. Can you imagine a puppy dog or a little baby? Imagine if you don't like animals or, or human beings, you can imagine like a bird. You can imagine even like one lady did a pot plant on her balcony in a small apartment in Sydney. Something which you feel a connection towards. Something which you care about. And I use a little kitten abandoned to know where the mother went the poor little kitten is alone you can hear it you don't need to read its mind to know that those sounds are sounds of fear but also sounds of desperation and even hope a tiny bit of hope there and it sees someone walking by and maybe just maybe that being may be able to give it some love and care and i see that little kitten see its eyes well i can see it first because it's hiding in some dark corner or recess we maintain eye contact but with a lot of kindness. Dear little kitten, the door of my heart is open to you. I will never ever harm you or hurt you. But actually it is my privilege that I can be of service and can help you. Giving is not a sacrifice. Giving is bringing joy to my practice. Please give me the opportunity to serve you, little kitten. These aren't just words, I mean them and I feel them. And imagining I'm really looking at an abandoned kitten. It's as if I can see those eyes in that kitten soften and its head emerge slowly out of the darkness in this little place where it hides away for safety. As it comes out, I continue looking at its eyes, giving as much loving kindness and care and compassion I can possibly muster. It's a tiny kitten. As it comes out, I know that sometimes some animals, cats especially, they really look after their hygiene. Their skin is all, their fur is always clean, and well washed, licked. It hasn't got a mother. And this little kitten's fur is all tangled. As it comes further out, it's as if I can see clots of blood on its skin, on its fur. That poor kitten, like many people, trust. They don't know who to trust. And sometimes they trust the wrong, wrong people, the wrong animals. And they get bitten and chased away. Imagine how 
difficult it is when you haven't got a bigger animal like a mother or a father to look after you and teach you how to survive and how to be safe and how to get food and how to have love. That little kitten is so afraid. But it knows it has to trust someone. Otherwise it will die a lonely, cold death. So still keeping eye contact and spreading as much loving kindness as I can generate from my heart into that little imaginary being. I extend my arm out and my hand. And of course, that little kitten doesn't know why I'm extending a hand out. And maybe it's to hurt that little kitten. I do it very slowly. Until that kitten allows me to touch her. It doesn't hurt. It's a hand of kindness. It allows me to put my hand underneath its belly. I can feel all the cut marks and the, the scabs of blood. That little kitten has been abused, beaten, bitten so many times. I very gently lift it up, still giving it this beautiful golden rays of loving kindness coming out from my own heart as much as I can. And I lift it up so softly, so gently. All I can feel is the bones protruding through its skin and fur. I don't know when that little kitten has ever eaten. You can feel just what a terrible first few days of life it's had. That it survived is a miracle. That it trusts is amazing. And it allows me to pick it up so softly and bring it to my own chest. And warm this little damaged, lonely, abandoned kitten with my own warmth. I hold it so softly because it could jump out at any time. You feel the tension in this body. Is this a being who would really look after it? Or is this just another, another trick which will hurt it so much? As I'm holding it to the chest, the reason I place that little kitten there is not just for the physical warmth, it was just right over my own physical heart and I just this is for me anyway this is my loving kindness seems to have its source in my chest and I don't just warm it with my own physical warmth I imagine this rays of golden light coming out of my heart through my skin of my chest and into this imaginary being warming it with kindness, spreading love into it. A meta, little kitten, the door of my heart is always open to you. Let me look after you, clean you, give you a safe place where you can rest, give you food, whatever food you need to eat. I care for you. When you give those feelings of loving kindness towards any being, it's very easy with an imaginary being. We've done this many times in real life. You can feel the skin and the muscles of that little kitten relax. They get all loose. And you can notice the little kitten even closes its eyes. It can rest. I don't know if it's resting, but I always imagine I hear it purring, maybe for the first time in its life. It knows it has someone who will look after it, protect it. The pain in its body, this hunger, is not as important as knowing it's loved and cared for. And the future is safe. You hold that kitten so softly. 
and you just bathe it in loving kindness. And as I'm bathing in loving kindness, I can feel the, the skin above my heart in my chest start to tingle. Those rays of loving kindness seem to be getting stronger. I spread this golden light, this warmth, this healing, this expression of kindness and love all over this cat's body, down to the end of its tail, to its little paws, right through its body, up to its head, to its ears and its whiskers and its little nose. I spread it everywhere there. This little kitten falls asleep. Maybe the first time it's rested, it knows it's safe. When I give out these feelings of loving kindness, they get stronger and I feel more joy. Now, it's like you flip the vision from a little kitten to someone you know, maybe your best friend. Maybe your lover, your child. If you're alone, it may be just, again, an animal that you're so, so close to. You imagine them right in front of you. As if they suddenly manifested and come to visit you. You look at them. They are just the same as a little animal, a little kitten. Even your best friend your lover, your closest associate. Even they get hurt so many times by life. Life can be so cruel, and disappointing, especially when you're by yourself. Now you have this being in front of you, the real being this time. They're not with you physically. You can almost see them. Now you give your loving kindness to them. My dear brother, sister, friend, parent, I care for you too. Imagine these rays of loving kindness going into them, right inside of them, up to their heads and their ears, their nose and their hair, down their arms, their fingertips, down their body to their, their toes. Every part of them you bathe with loving kindness. They need it. Everybody always benefits from receiving meta. You're not asking anything back in return, you're just giving, giving beautiful loving kindness. The more you give, the more powerful these rays are. You're developing a beautiful insight here. The more you give, the more you have to give. You're building up the power of selfless loving kindness. Beautiful golden light up and down in and out with your best friend. And now you move that image away. Now you imagine all the people listening to this right now all the people who joined in this retreat with you. They've all gone through the same inspirations and desperations which you have been through. Aches, pains, sicknesses, disappointments. You can see how we share, how much we share with the little abandoned kitten. So often you feel that you're abandoned too. Lonely. They know how to cope, hurting. Many people you trusted hurt you. So you have so much in common with that little kid. Each one of you now get those beautiful feelings of loving kindness. And spread them to everybody who's on this retreat. How does this work? Does it go through the internet over Zoom? No way. 
many things in this world, especially spiritual things, that distance has no meaning. Sometimes time doesn't have meaning. Just by thinking about all the people you've seen when you maybe watch the, the gallery view of this people on this retreat, people actually you know. Give as much loving kindness to them as you possibly can. This golden ray spreading to everybody on this retreat. And you're also receiving it as well. How do you feel? All these people, your friends, associates, maybe people you never met before, they're listening to the same words, hopefully feeling the same golden energy, transcending the distances and the space of planet Earth. Allow the golden light of other people to come into your heart. As it comes in, it stays there, grows and goes out to the other people on this retreat. Warming, healing. And knowing you're loved. You're cared for. By people who don't want anything back in return. It's a privilege to give, to care and to serve. You. How does that feel? Now, extend it further. Once it's strong enough, don't go too fast. Once it's strong enough, send it to your other relatives and friends. Wherever they are in this world, your associates, people you've met and not here on this retreat. May all these beings, with all the pain and difficulties and disappointment of life, all the pains of sickness, emotional pains of even depression, or even people dying in pain. Give them huge amounts of your loving kindness. Specific people who you know. May all these beings please receive our beautiful golden light of loving kindness. Not yours anymore. Mine goes into you, yours goes into mine. We join it all together. This golden light spreading, spreading wider and wider. Here in Perth, it's spreading over the monastery right now. Bodhinyana Monastery in Chanagra. For you, it's Raya Chanda spreading over Gloucestershire. And all the people you've met there, and for those in Germany and United States, imagine it spreading around you. The more it grows, the stronger it gets. All these people you've known and met, may you all receive this beautiful, healing, welcoming, safe, loving kindness. We care for one another. Not just the human beings, even animals as well. Insects, the insects which crawl in the ground, there are kangaroos out here in Bodhinyana Monastery right now, and the joeys, the birds in the sky, even little flies. It's the fly season here in Perth. Hundreds of little flies buzzing around all over the place. May all of you be happy and well. Free from fear. Free from pain. Just doing what you have to do in life and spread that loving kindness so far so strong it covers the whole of planet earth just like you would love to feel an intense loving kindness the many beings in our world even the leaders people who work in in governments, in military, they do some terrible decisions sometimes. But the best way to help and heal them 
is given this kindness. May all the beings in this world receive my love, my kindness. There may be people you married before or just ended disastrously. Maybe people who hurt you, people who made decisions which really cause you so much more difficulty. May all beings in this world, we mean it, be happy and well. May you feel this peace, this joy, this freedom. So you don't need anything more. You don't need to exploit others. You realize the greatest happiness comes through sharing, through giving, not through taking and hurting. May all beings in this world be at peace. You feel that. How does it feel? With one being, you've missed out. Imagine it now. You're looking in a full length body mirror at yourself. This being who bears your name. This being who is vulnerable, who makes mistakes. Look at yourself and say, me, with all my faults and defects, I'm trying the best I can. I do really care for others. Now I care for myself. May I receive this loving kindness. I feel like golden energy going into my body, up to my head, to my toes, to my fingertips, all over. Bathe and drench yourself in the golden energy of love and kindness. You deserve it. You deserve to be healthy. You deserve to be at peace. You deserve to feel joy. You deserve to feel the respect which other people give you. You feel that. Let it grow inside of you. Now, imagine all this beautiful gold and light which you have shared over the whole world. Imagine drawing it back inside yourself. Leaving the warmth out there, but allowing the light to recede inside of you. Like a seed to be used in another time. Imagine your heart like a white lotus fully open. And this beautiful golden light is coming in and in and in until it's like a golden ball of tents. But soft. It's hovering of this open white lotus, which represents your heart inside of you. It's very soft and gentle leaves of closing in, guarding, enveloping, guarding this seed of loving kindness to use at another time, another place. At this point, I always do this. Let's give a little chant for you all, a blessing chant for me, for the happiness and well being of you all. Nati me saranang anyang, udo me saranang walang, 
I've gone over time again, but I don't think you can call it over time. It's beautiful to give love and kindness to everybody. And I know that Derek is supposed to say something soon and I'm supposed to say something because this is the last time I can contribute. But we're going to go over time, I'm sure. Please excuse us. So for me, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve. Weird thing which I found. I always thought that when you give, other people should say thank you. There's a person who gives in the end says thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity to share, to give my life for an important cause. And that's uh, today, Anna Kumpa. Uh, Venerable Chan has heard me say this so many times. This is not the end of the retreat, by the way. It's, what's to be done later on in the afternoon and evening sessions for you. But for me, because it's night time, it's 20 past nine now in the evening. So in about 10, 15, 20 minutes, I'll be just making sure I get ready to go to bed another busy day tomorrow. I don't really call it busy days, another great opportunity to serve and help others. But anyway, it's a beautiful opportunity. You've formed some spiritual community here, each one of you. And please don't allow it to fade away. Whenever you have grown something which is valuable and beautiful, it's not that now it's here, it's going to stay here. You've got to maintain it. And after a while, it maintains and it grows and grows and grows. And it serves you as well as serving so many other beings. What a beautiful opportunity that is. From the highest forms of human life is to serve the Sangha. And let the Sangha serve you. And little by little, that community just grows and grows and grows. It creates a beautiful, beautiful environment. And when people visit, they get inspired. Such things are possible in this world, even today. How fortunate it is that we can witness this, serve it, be part of it, and enjoy it. So, where Derek is, I don't know where you are. You're out? Or you just blissed out in meditation? Sometimes that happens to me, and sometimes it's really hard to carry on. Sometimes, you know, when I do my chanting, I told this when I do meta chanting. And some of those chants are just too powerful for me. And I, I really mean that. You start chanting it and you just go into deep meditation. Because I understand the meaning of those words. Those meanings are beautiful. So anyway. So this is, uh, oh, I think uh, Derek was supposed to say something about dana. So I'll say that instead. Giving. Helping others. Oh, you know, when I is he here? Oh, no, I'll just carry on. Yeah, he's waiting, okay. Arjun. Yeah. Oh, Derek's waiting. I'll say sorry. Okay, I'll shut up for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Let Derek carry on. Okay, Derek. I wouldn't want to interrupt you, Ajan, because you're so much better at speaking than I am. But hello, everyone. In this yeah wonderful opportunity, I I uh, am so grateful for this opportunity to speak to you as well. And I would first like to hope that. You've all had a valuable and rewarding week and retreat as much as we have 
And I would like to thank everybody here for creating such a wonderful atmosphere and so much kindness and peace. And it's been really great to be part of that with you. So thank you for that. And I'd like to also thank the co-host team for your kindness and your service. I would like to thank Venerable Chanda for giving me the opportunity, giving us the opportunity to serve. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the two teachers, Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm, for all the guidance, support and inspiration and for the teachings. It's something that is very fortunate to have the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a place where we could meet up in person, where we could develop the precepts together, where we could offer service and maybe offer, Chan, offer Venerable Chanda a caretaker position where we could look after her or where we could offer food or where we could sit in meditation together and receive teachings. And this is the aim of the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, which we're here together to do. And it's a place for all people, all people, no matter what their gender or sexual orientation or even religion, all people coming together to practice and to develop peace and love and kindness. And it's especially a place for bhikkhunis to train and to serve the world as well. And Venerable Chande is somebody who serves a great deal, as we all know, she's there very often giving teachings and so many regular teaching events, such as the Wednesday evening chanting and the Friday Sutta discussion and Saturdays, there's often meta meditation together. And Sundays, she often gives a Dharma, a Dharma talk as well. So, so many regular teachings that are given by Venerable Chanda already. And if you're interested in joining any of these, then please visit our website. It's anukampaproject.org. And especially for the events, please visit anukampaproject.org forward slash events. And you'll be able to see there's events that happen regularly and you'll be able to see the exact dates and times and how to join. And all of these events and the retreat are offered on a donation basis. So if you would like to support this project and support this opportunity to always come together or regularly come together and practice and serve, then please consider giving whatever you can to support the project. And all donations are really gratefully received. It's anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. So one more time, thank you all for your presence. And please join us again for the rest of the sessions this afternoon. And thank you so much to both teachers because it's really wonderful to have this opportunity. Thank you. It's also, it's also, yeah, it's also wonderful. Uh, one of the greatest donations you can give is actually to look after the <laughs> agenda. Sometimes, uh, I'm just being honest, that sometimes she works overly hard Lots of things she has to do. She hasn't got a place to stay, for goodness sake. But, you know, to get a place to stay is a lot of work. So how about you guys doing it for her? You know what she wants, what she needs. But in the, in the not so distant future, you know, she, I'm going to let, let people know you plan to come to Perth as soon as it's possible so that you can have a bit of a rest over here. And not just having a rest, but meet other sort of uh, the spiritual friends. And the way she can come over here for a while and then go back over to, to England. But I actually even challenge you while she's away. Don't tell her, don't tell me. Get a beautiful place for her. <laughs> you know what she likes. You've seen that before. And to <laughs> surprise her <laughs> with this lovely little place. And you know, for fans, what a beautiful thing it is to do to support places like this. I just, I've just been really impressed with all the lay supporters which I've met over these years. Just, you know, when it really is necessary, they always come up with something. And every time I've just committed myself to projects which are way out of reach, and then beautiful forces, they come and help out. And it always gets some beautiful results in the end, and they're, they're really inspiring. It's almost like, like faith and confidence that what you're doing is beautiful and good and pure 
They don't have any pains. Please excuse me, but I was a theoretical physicist. And I have any pains are, are real. And they come and help out. They realize how important it is and beautiful it is to have virtuous people living in this world. The people who teach virtue and encourage virtue in our world. So it's a good thing it's worth giving to. And so say, so how do how much do I give? That story, I was in a Sri Lankan temple in Singapore. And after visiting for the first time, they said, oh, please sign the visitor's book. I picked up the wrong book. It wasn't a visitor's book, it was a donation book. I'd already put down my name and address. <laughs> and the next thing to fill in was how much are you giving? I couldn't rub it out, it was in pen. I mean, and so I thought, well, how can I get out of this problem? So in the amount of donation, which I wrote in that book, it was just two words, M-Y and then L-I-F-E. I give my life. It was beautiful. <laughs> I was just so inspired by that. That's so how much you give my life. And of course, you never miss out there. But by my life, I can give my life. But be very careful that you don't get Aya Chanda to write that in a book. Otherwise, you would die young. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we mean. If you can, all the resources you have, look after her and make sure that, you know, be honest and have a look at her when she's tired, when she needs a bit of a break. There's something which a monastic, maybe you don't realize this, but monastic needs other monastics. We would have called it Samana Sanya, the perception of other monastics being around you. And she hasn't got that at the moment. Was it two or three years? So I can see. Five years, you haven't been here? Six years. No. I've been there for three months every year. Oh, yeah. But that was two years well, ago. That's all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, nearly. But he's got some Samana Sanya. Anyway, little by little. So we look after one another, care for one another, and make sure that when you, know, you associate with other good monks and nuns, then you grow. It's, whether you like it or not, you grow. You pick up the virtue, you pick up the attitudes, the, the kind, nice speech. That's how it works. So again, please, out of this time now, I'm supposed to depart. But please remember, <laughs> please also remember that, you know, that uh, in the afternoon you give a lot of feedback to Ayachanda and she needs your support, but not just money stuff, just by making sure you're here for the afternoon meditation for the evening. Well, uh, so discussion, to give some feedback, and understand just how she works. And for Aya Chanda to please don't ever be afraid of being honest and say that, you know, I get tired and I get very sort of, uh, oh, sometimes just missing the presence of other good monks and nuns, brownies. How important that is. Thank you, Aya. I'm listening to okay. you, feeling very cared for and incredibly yeah. grateful and overflowing with what i also want to say in terms of expressing my gratitude to yeah, everyone yeah. here and first of all to all the participants oh, it's not over yet so yeah. i will be expressing that again but um you know being around you even though okay there aren't many monastics around me we do have one monastic here which is wonderful and i really appreciate that and even so, I still feel a real sense of spiritual community with everybody here. And your practice supports me as well. So it's not only that the two teachers are supporting you, but you're supporting us and you're supporting the Dhamma and you're keeping the Dhamma alive through your love of the Dhamma and dedication to practice. So that's incredibly inspiring. And as I said the other day, I was very touched when I um, came into the silent sitting that you have every day. And I saw that about 30 people who just come together silently to support each other. And it felt so beautiful. And I really um, 
benefited from your group energy, the shared energy that magically comes through the Zoom. So this was really wonderful. And I also want to thank everybody here who has been or will be or could be or even thinks about serving an Kampo project and the Dhamma in general, because it's not only our monastery, but there are other monasteries, there are other Dhamma centers. And just serving your communities in daily life, whether at work or in your family, just by virtue of being who you are. So thank you all very much for everything you do, and I hope you can continue to be involved. And of course, a special thank you to the co-hosts, Matthias, Derek and Rennie, who have been absolutely exceptional, very beautiful to work with, so much harmony, so much care, and so much expertise as well. You know, you all know exactly what you're doing. You give helpful links to the group. They always have the Sutta references at hand whenever I mention it in the class and it's just really a privilege to work with you all so thank you and I know that you don't even need thanks because you do it from the love in your heart but I feel like expressing thanks because without you it would be a very different experience I would be far more burned out <laughs> but as it is I feel kind of supported and as we've been doing this over the years it's become increasingly easy only my energy is wearing down but the actual running of things is increasingly easy and smooth and most of all I want to thank my very revered teacher Ajahn Brahm who's the most incredible example to me in every way um, in terms of your practice but also in terms of your incredible service by giving your life not only to this project but just to the Dhamma all over the world and it's just incredibly inspiring um, I think everybody here can experience that and I feel incredibly privileged to be so um, well supported by you as a teacher, as a colleague, as a spiritual friend, and as a Dhamma father. So that comes from the heart. And of course, no words can ever really express that. So what I try to do is serve. And that's my expression of gratitude to you and to all my teachers. And of course, going back to the Buddha himself. So whatever I do is not through my own strength or courage or that strength and courage comes from the Dhamma and comes from my teachers really um so yes i just want to thank you for that so. okay but you missed out one person so <laughs> may i formally thank Aya Chanda for organizing this and for sacrificing so much to be here for you all <laughs> amazing sometimes she's told me i'm going to tell people what you told me and so oh the afternoon what am i going to do can i manage this in the afternoon in the evening you managed it very well. It's not easy for you, but it's a wonderful job you've done. So on behalf of everybody, thank you. Ayachanda from your, your teacher and all the other people in Anukampa. And before I go, we usually uh, put a bit of effort into saying a sort of sadhu. So I'm going to do the three impressive, over the top sadhu. Sadhu means awesome. And this is especially for you, for Aya Chanda, awesome Chanda. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you for everybody's practice. Okay, and I'll Thank see you, you next Ajahn. time. Take care, have a good rest, and I'll see you all yeah. again in uh, what we'll do now is we'll actually keep the session open I think it'll be easier and we'll meet again in 20 minutes at two o'clock uh, and we'll have some questions you can talk to me at that time so properly you can actually talk you can raise your hands okay. and then we'll have some little groups where you can talk to each other as well so I'll see you in 20 minutes get a cup of tea turn your video off if you want to but please don't leave the meeting I take care Ajahn good night okay, good night see ya <laughs>